I guess the scripture passage didn't actually make it up there. It just says the message is about scripture, which is true. <laughs> um, wow. But if you have a Bible and want to follow along, we're looking at um, Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. I'll get mine open, too. Romans 15, 5 and 6. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for these words, um, these words of blessing and encouragement for us this morning, and we ask that you teach us from them more about who we are and who we are as your children. In your name we pray. Amen. So I love these two short verses. It's one of those um, great blessings in Scripture. It would make a good benediction for the end of the service this morning. Um, but, of course, I'm a pastor, so I can't just leave two verses hanging there by themselves. I have to look at the whole context. Um, and this time, I'm really glad that I did. You see, this blessing from, from Paul, written to the church in Rome, um, was meant to combat legalism. It seems in this church in Rome that the attitude had kind of developed that to follow Jesus was to follow the rules. There was this very, very straight and narrow path to walk, and if you didn't quite stay on that path, then you had totally left the faith, or so it seems, in this church. Now, I don't know about you, maybe you think differently than me, granted I'm a Packer fan, so, uh, <laughs> but I, that, that seems kind of familiar to me, that feels a little familiar. I know in my own walk in faith, my own walk with God, I've fallen prey to that kind of thinking too, that to follow Christ was to keep the rules and to do it all right, and, and then we're good to go. I remember when I was in high school, um, I, was, I was in youth group in high school, and we were talking about the Ten Commandments good list of rules. I like lists and schedules and checking things off. And I remember my youth leader saying that none of us will ever keep all these rules perfectly. You've probably heard that before. But I was just conceited enough and just competitive enough in high school that I took that as a challenge. You know, I said, really, no one can do it. I think I'm the one to try. So I did this nerdy little experiment where I kind of held one of the commandments in my mind for a week. And I... Um, I tried to follow that one perfectly that week, and I made it 10 weeks without killing anybody, and I, I survived without wishing I had my neighbor's donkey, that's in there. Uh, <laughs> I, I made it through all of those things, um, but the more I, I learned about the Ten Commandments and the more we kept looking at them in my youth group, I learned that my youth leader was right. I couldn't follow them perfectly. You know, Jesus says that to, to have hatred in your heart towards someone is the same as killing them. So while I didn't actually go out and murder anybody, I was a high school girl. So you can bet that I had some hateful thoughts towards people during those 10 weeks. <laughs> you know, these, these rules are there, but they're, they're impossible for us to follow because we're human and we're broken, we're bent, we're not the way that God wants us to be, not yet. But sometimes it's so easy to boil our faith down to a set of rules, to a set of regulations. And what Paul writes in this short little blessing in Romans is that our faith and scripture is about so much more than that. It's about endurance and hope and a new attitude. Those things that maybe some of us need as we walk through some of these hard things that have been happening the last few weeks. What Paul is saying in Romans 14 and 15 is that our walk and our journey with Christ is, is not just about keeping the rules, and it's not just about the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law to give us hope and peace. The kingdom of God is about hope and joy and righteousness and the spirit. So Paul says that there are three gifts that he prays that scripture will give to us as believers, to the church in Rome and to us today. So this morning I want to look at those three gifts in turn and look at what God might be saying about those gifts to us this morning. So first it says, um, the first gift is endurance. So, at least for me, endurance isn't a word that I often connect with my faith right away. You know, hope and love and faith and encouragement, that's in there. Those things connect right away, but endurance took a little thinking. Um, so here's what I came up with. I'm, I'm a bit of a runner, or okay, I admit I haven't actually gone on a run since I've had Nora, so I used to be a bit of a runner and I hope to be a bit of a runner again, but I'm not right now. Um, but anyway, before I got pregnant, I was training for a 15K race, about nine and a half miles. 
Um, so I did a 5K, I did one with Alice, and I did some some 10K runs, and I was getting ready, but I um, the longer I ran, the worse I felt. I didn't have very good endurance. You know, I could run further and further, but the longer I did it, the more, I mean, after I ran, I was just kind of done for the day. That was it. That was all that was going to happen. I was super sore. So I tried to think, okay, how do I build up my endurance? So I read some magazines and articles and did some research, and here are the four things that I came up that endurance entails. Energy, stamina, focus, and intentionality. Endurance requires energy, stamina, focus, and intentionality. So I was working on the stamina thing when I was running, right? I was running further and further, so I had kind of that sort of down. But then I, I started weight training. I started lifting some weights because I knew that muscle gave you more energy. And I started eating differently, you know, eating not just because I like ice cream sundaes, so I'm going to have an ice cream sundae, but eating to give me energy. And I tried to, to focus on different things as I was running. So I ran some intervals and speed trials. And some days I'd go uphill and some days I'd go downhill and gave me different ways to focus in my running. And I, I became more intentional as I ran. You know, everything from the way I put my foot on the ground to the rhythm of my breathing made a difference in how well I could run. And I started becoming more intentional. And after I did those things, then my endurance grew. Once I stopped just focusing on the stamina and going further, once I had energy, stamina, focus, and intentionality, then my endurance could grow. Finally, I could run 10 miles and feel kind of okay for the rest of the day. It made a big difference. Paul says that God gave us the scriptures so that we could have endurance in our faith. And I think that our endurance in our faith requires those same things that my endurance in running required. Our faith requires an energy and focus and stamina and intentionality. Our faith needs the kind of stickiness that my running needed. And I think the same kind of training is required for our faith. You know, just like my running needed to train me through uphills and downhills and, and tired days and ice cream sundaes, our faith needs to be able to survive through life's uphills and downhills and tired days and ice cream sundaes. All areas of our life and our faith require endurance. Whether we find ourselves in a season today that's sad or difficult or joyful or boring or contented, we require endurance to keep running the race that God has before us. In John 16, it says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's endurance. That's perseverance. That's that's going forward in the faith, knowing that no matter where we are in life, whatever might be happening around us, we know the one who has the victory, so we can take heart and keep going and persevere. And Paul says that's what God gave us the scriptures for, to give us this endurance. This is, God's, this is Paul's prayer for the church, that we would have that endurance and find it in God's word for us. What a great gift. So that brings us to number two on our gift, or on our list, encouragement. Paul says the scriptures are for endurance and encouragement. So this one probably is a little bit easy for us all to grasp, right? We can, we can go to the scriptures for encouragement. Scripture can inspire us when we're on the brink of something new. It can, it can help us have that endurance, right, to keep going. It can make us feel better if we're feeling down, or it can refocus us if we've kind of lost our way. I know I've turned to scripture lots of times for encouragement. I'm, I'm a young pastor and a female pastor, which can kind of be a hard combination sometimes. Um, so I often cling to the verse um, in 1 Timothy 4.12 that says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That's a huge encouragement for me as I go through my week and, and try to be faithful in ministry. Another passage that's often encouraged me is um, from Psalm 46, where in the midst of mountains falling in the heart of the sea and oceans roaring and foaming, God says, be still and know that I am God. I've turned to that verse over and over when, when difficult things happen. And I'm sure we could go around the room and we could all share stories or verses of times when scripture has encouraged us. 
through difficult things. But here's the thing, encouragement is one of those things that begs to be relational. You know, I don't know about you, but when I feel encouraged, I, I want to share it with someone. I feel better, and I want to tell someone else about it. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, very simply, encourage one another and build each other up. That's part of God's dream for us as his people. In, in Romans 14, verse 15, 14 and 15, leading up to our verses, it, it talks a lot about the, the need to encourage each other, not bind each other down with legalism, not hold each other strictly to the letter of the law, but instead encourage each other to be faithful as best we can. That's part of where this blessing is coming from. So if you've, if you've been around the harbor for a while, you've probably heard me say that I love personality tests and spiritual gifts assessments and stuff. So whenever I take one, the one thing that I always expect to show up about myself and it never ever has is encouragement. I like to think of myself as a pretty encouraging person. I have all kinds of things that I would like to say about how someone's inspired me or thank someone for helping me or something like that. But I'm learning that those all kind of stay in my head, <laughs> which, is, which isn't very encouraging to the rest of you if I never actually say it, but it takes a kind of vulnerability to be encouraging, doesn't it? It makes you kind of feel a little unsafe and a little maybe too raw, too open, at least for me. So, so I often just keep all these really nice things about all of you to myself <laughs> and don't actually encourage you with them. So in 2014, what I decided to do was my Thursday thing would be to try and write a note of encouragement to someone. I didn't do it every Thursday, I wasn't perfect, but I tried to be fairly regular. So I wrote cards to friends who lived far away, some who lived nearby, and this incredible thing happened. As I tried to encourage others, they in turn encouraged me, and there kind of became this circular encouragement thing happening. I remember having dinner at a friend's house, and I saw my card on their, their fridge, and they mentioned, you know, oh, that was, really, that was a really nice card. Thanks for sending that. And then they, in turn, said something in response to me. And it was kind of this, this turnabout that I didn't expect. Encouragement, encouragement um, begs to be relational. And I think, I think that shouldn't have been so surprising, the circle of encouragement. I think part of God's dream for us as his people is that we could live in this way of selflessly encouraging each other. He gave us the scriptures to encourage us, to give us fuel for the fire and to empower us to encourage someone else. He wants us to live together with this attitude that Christ Jesus had that we'd be united in our love for one another, and man, what an incredible, beautiful way to do that, but to encourage each other along the way. Plus, encouragement goes a long way when it comes to endurance, doesn't it? I know when I run, I love to train with my friend Michelle, because she's such a good encourager. She just kind of cheers me on, even if she's miles ahead of me. <laughs> she's cheering me on. In fact, I even made a playlist for when I would run that has a song where there's a section of the song where they just go, 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 go. And it's, it's perfect. It's a great song to run to because it's so encouraging. See, so an encouragement is this hugely powerful thing. And encouragement gives us the power and the courage, right, to endure in this walk with God no matter what's going on in our lives and in the world around us. So that's gift number two. So we've had... Um, we've had endurance and we've had encouragement. So finally, the third gift that Paul prays for scripture to give the church is a new attitude. The same attitude towards others that Christ Jesus had towards us. If we have the same attitude towards Christ or towards each other that Christ had towards us, I think that unites us. That helps bring us together. We all, if we all view each other with the love and the grace that Christ views with us, can you imagine the change that would happen in our lives and in our church and in our families, our relationships? Of course, this begs a question, what exactly is Christ's attitude towards us? So rather than me stand up here and tell you, why don't you just, just throw out some, some words that you would use to describe Christ's attitude towards us? Patient. Patient, yeah. Interested. Interest that I wouldn't have thought of that. That's good. Service. Mm -hmm. Humble. Humble, yeah. Compassionate, accepting. <clears throat> Very compassionate, accepting. Loving. Loving. Gentle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Unconditional love. Yeah. Forgiving. Forgiving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, you guys, you guys could preach this sermon. All of, all of these words, these great describing words that we came up with for Christ's attitude towards us, right? That's how God calls us to view each other. If Christ is accepting towards us, we need to be accepting towards each other. If Christ has unconditional love towards us, we need to have unconditional love towards each other. And the list goes on and on. And can you imagine what a difference that would make? in our lives and in our world and in our church. Can you imagine what would happen if we actually held these attitudes towards each other every single day? Our tendency as people is to be so cruel. I remember when I was in seminary, um, Fuller Seminary where I went always asks for feedback after every class. And when I started, they, they moved to online feedback forms for the first time. It was written in paper, and then they went online. And something about the anonymity of being online to give feedback for form or for, for professors made everyone really mean. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, these really professional, well-published, multiple-degree-holding men and women were really literally going home in tears because of what some of us as students were saying. It became less about the class and more about personal attacks, just because we could say it online. All you have to do is go on to any YouTube video, just pick one and look at the comments, and you will see just how mean we can be. I'm, I'm a mom now, so I've, I've looked at some mommy forums online. There's supposed to be places where you can share resources and stories and find support. Um, but Tina Fey, the, the writer and actress, once said that these mommy forums showcase the worst of human behavior. <laughs> and it's so true. They're awful. Do not look at forums on motherhood. Because it's all of a sudden you go from one little tidbit of information, it becomes a personal attack. So someone might say, oh, you're formula feeding your baby? Ooh, call child services. You are the worst mother I've ever seen. Or you're letting your baby cry instead of rocking them. Oh, you should never have children again. Or you're rocking them and not letting them cry. How can you even be a person? You know, these awful, awful things are being said based on this one little snippet of information. Our schools are talking about bullying and the long-term effects that bullying have on our psyches. I just had a friend post on Facebook last night um, apologizing to the world for acting defensive because he had been bullied as a child and when people tease him, even in good fun, he immediately reacts defensively. But it has these long-term effects. That guy's in his 30s and that happened in maybe sixth grade. <laughs> and it, the meanness changes us. I know families who have banned political conversations because what starts as an interesting conversation about foreign policy or money turns into personal attacks so quickly. We can be so cruel to one another. Too often we see just a glimpse of a person, just a little piece of their story, and we decide that we're better than them, we're more deserving than them, we know something that they don't know, and immediately we can get mean especially, I think, in this day and age of the internet. Yet when we look at the example of Jesus, he views us with grace. He views us with an attitude of mercy and humility and love and acceptance and patience and all those beautiful words that you threw out this morning. And Jesus knows every part of us, not just these little snippets that we often give each other, but he knows everything about our, our hearts and our decisions, our relationships, and yet he still views us with grace. That's the attitude that Jesus had towards us, and that's what Paul calls us here this morning to view each other with that attitude. Can you imagine the difference that that would make? Now, I don't think that that means that we let go of discipline or tough love when necessary. That's part of loving each other, right? If you read the Gospels, Jesus didn't let it slide when people were misusing the temple. He was turning over tables. He was so mad. He didn't let it slide when the disciples tried to turn away the children and not let them come to him. He didn't let it slide when people were doing wrong or were accusing others of wrong things. That was part of that grace and that love that he had towards us. And yet he still loved us absolutely unconditionally, not letting us go, not letting us stay in our wrong, but still loving us 
wholeheartedly. His entire attitude was one of love and mercy and grace. So what does that mean for our attitude towards each other? If we're called to have the same attitude towards each other that Christ had towards us, what does that mean? We're called to love each other like a parent loves her child, not like mommy bloggers love or don't love each other. <laughs> we're called to love each other, maybe, maybe holding each other accountable when we need to, but still loving each other deeply and unconditionally. That's the gift that Christ gave us. That's the, one of the gifts we see in Scripture this morning, the gift that gives us endurance and encouragement and a new attitude towards each other. And praise God for those gifts. So this morning, how will we be different as we leave this place? What will being here do to change us? How will we find endurance in the season of life that we're in? How will we find that endurance that has focus and stamina and intentionality? How will we be encouraged in scripture and let that encouragement empower us to encourage others? How will that change? And how will we change our attitudes? How will we see each other differently? I'll leave you to ponder those questions this morning as we sing our last song, but let's, let's say a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for these gifts, these gifts that Paul tells us we can find in Scripture and find in, in your example in Jesus. Lord, we ask that you give us the boldness and the courage to, um, to find that endurance and to live with endurance and encouragement and a new attitude that's the same as yours towards us. In your name we pray. Amen.